Welcome to The Rock. We hope what you watch today inspires you. And we'd love to hear your questions and comments via Twitter at The Rock of York. You can also find us on Facebook or contact us through the website at www.rockofyork.co.uk. In the meantime, let's crack on. All right, so I have some props again tonight. Not that you're going to get this every week. However, I'm just in a prop mood at the moment. So um, <coughs> I'm, I'm, in quite, I'm in quite a mystical, spiritual place right now. You just have to know. Um, I'll talk, tell you next week about how um, in a week or so's time, Chris and I are going on a pilgrimage. And I'll tell you about that. Okay. I have a brick. I've got a stone and a bag of soil, <coughs> but we'll come to that later. And I'll move the bag because it won't look pretty when it's on set. Also, welcome to everybody watching online and who gets this on podcast and our family, our people from The Rock who will catch up on this later on holiday now at live or later we welcome you. Okay, so... <clears throat> There's something going on in all of our lives of which most of us are totally unaware. We don't realize it, but we are actually building altars all the time. Now, I don't mean that we are taking ornate colors of cloth and, and wonderful oak or wood and, and gold leaf and and building like a church altar, but, but, but inside, in our lives, we, we're all building all the time altars. The question is, are they of the right kind to the right things? An altar is a memorial to something. We are all the time building memorials to something. And those memorials are just like altars because it establishes how we have determined to remember something. So we build this invisible altar in our mind, in, in, inside, in our spirit, in our soul. But when we build it, 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 it establishes how we've determined to remember that something. And it's then a place that we go and pay homage. There are lots of scriptures I could bring to you about this, but I'm going to be very sparse on that just to give you a few for some idea. But way, way back in the Old Testament, in the book of Joshua, this group of people called the children of Israel had journeyed out of a place of slavery and captivity and, and found themselves in a desert place. How many of you have ever found yourself in a desert even though you've been set free from something that was a slavery. And they were journeying to a place that God had promised. I, I, in, in Jewish history, people would call it the promised land. I don't like that description. I don't think it conveys the nuance of what it really means because that kind of locates it on a people and a place. I like to call it the land of promise. Because it means where they arrived was full of promise. They used descriptions that don't mean much to us today, but they called it a land flowing with milk and honey. Because in their culture, milk spoke of nurturing. And honey spoke of sweetness or joy. So this land was not a land exclusively for one group of people at one time in history. It's a land that all of us are invited to come to and Jesus came to give us that opportunity to, to enter a land of promise. Our life is supposed to be full of promise. From the day we're born until the day we're reborn. Because when we close our eyes in what we know as death, it's actually a birth into something else. And this promise is, is to be part of our lives 
all the time. So, so there in that story about these people, they had to cross over the River Jordan to get into this place of promise. They had come to an obstacle after being in a desert, having been released from slavery, and to get into this place of promise... And living in this promise, they had to cross a river. It was the River Jordan. And so God did an amazing thing. Whether you believe it literally or not is of no issue to me whatsoever. What is important to me is that you actually believe that we can cross the barriers that separate us from the promise that should be at work in our lives. So what happened is God supernaturally separates the water, he opens the water, and the, this group of people, the children of Israel, go through to the other side. Now, this is where we pick up this story in verse 7 of Joshua chapter 4. Tell them <clears throat> that the flow of the Jordan was cut off before the Ark of the Covenant. That was the representation of God with them. Uh, of the Lord. And when it crossed the Jordan, the waters of the Jordan were cut off. So the people walked through and he said, now these stones are to be a memorial to the people of Israel forever. Because he had told them, according to what God told him, before you come out of the river that you're crossing, 12 of you, one from each group, each tribe, each culture, the rich, the poor, right, the bright, the thick, one of you from each part of culture, go back into the river, pick up a stone from the river bed, and bring it out to the side of promise, and then we are to build something with those stones that will be a memorial to the people forever. It became an altar. The altar was a memorial. It established how we were to re remember the something that had happened to us. Now, let me give you another couple of verses from way back in the book of Genesis. Because altars also became a place of recollection and reflection. So bring these stones out, build this altar, this memorial, so that when your children ask, there is a time of recollection and reflection. In other words, what had happened was supposed to be a joyful thing that passed on generationally to encourage you that God is with you and what God did here, he continues to do and so it becomes a point of recollection and reflection. Now, Genesis 35 verse 3. Then come, let us go up to Bethel where I will build an altar to God who answered me in the day of my distress, this is Jacob, and who has been with me wherever I have gone. Let's go to Bethel and build an altar. Why? To celebrate the God who answered me in my distress, distress and to celebrate that he has been with me wherever I have gone. Genesis 13, verse 3. From the Negev, this is about Abraham. From the Negev, he went to the, from place to place until he came to Bethel, the same place. That word Bethel means the house of God. To the place between Bethel and Ahai, where his tent had been earlier and where he had first built an altar. There Abraham called on the name of the Lord. So an altar is a place you set up where you go and worship whatever the altar was set up for. Now, I want you to catch that because, remember what we said, we don't realize it, but we're all building altars all the time. And whatever that memorial is, whatever that recollection is, whatever that reflection is, from whatever happened in your life, you have built an altar, and it's where you go and worship whatever the altar was set up for. What we sacrifice at the altars of our lives is determined by the altar itself. So some of you have built altars for events in your life which were not joyful, which were not full of promise, which were not constructive, which were not helpful, which were disappointing and full of disillusionment, and you still go and worship at that altar. And here's what you sacrifice, your peace, 
your contentment, your well-being, your hope, your faith, your expectancy, and ultimately your sanity is what you sacrifice on that altar. What we sacrifice at those altars is determined by the altar itself. So don't build altars which allow you to keep revisiting the sin and disappointment of a situation. Don't build altars that allow you to keep revisiting the devastation and the disappointment of a situation. Don't build altars that keep returning you to the frustration and the disillusionment of a situation because you will build an altar to something and you will worship at that altar and you will give something of yourself in sacrifice. You better make sure if all of us are building altars all the time that they're the right kind of altar to the right things. I believe possibly the greatest altar ever, the cross, was not built to remind us how sinful we are, but how loving God is. But so many of the altars in our lives are there and remind us how sinful we are and how sinful someone else is and how sinful someone else has been. When we need to have altars in our life that serve the purpose not of reminding us how sinful we are or how sinful someone else is, but how loving God is and how grateful we are. How we remember a thing is not necessarily how it happened. Many of us are building altars with distorted memories from misunderstood situations that we then go and worship. We need to leave that stuff alone and get on the right altar built in which I'm going to talk to you about in just a moment. Because we can finish up building an altar in a place where how we remember those things may not necessarily be exactly how they happened. We don't build enough altars of the right kind in our lives. They're meant to be the sacred spaces and the sacred places where God met us and we meet God. We don't build enough altars of the right kind in our lives. The ones that mark, I don't know what was going on, but but God met me there. I made it through. I got out of that. I was delivered. God provided. So that our altars are built to the times when we met God and God meets us. And then when we come to those altars and, and we come to make sacrifice, we find a sacred space and a sacred place. In a busy world, it's so easy for us with all the technology around us to miss the necessity and the importance of sacred space and sacred place in our lives. You cannot produce it through professionality. You cannot produce it through corporate ability. It has to be something that comes from a melted heart. Here's what a guy called David said about altars. We've got to stop thinking of them purely in terms of for sin. That it's a place where you make restitution and you appease someone's anger. Because most of our images of altars, it's where you make restitution and you appease someone's answer. And so those are the kind of altars that we tend to see in the context of God in our lives. But I want you to think more in terms of celebration and honor. We built that altar to celebrate and to honor what happened in our lives. And then when we come to our place of reflection and remembrance, 
We remember the time of honor. We remember the time of blessing. We remember the deliverance. We bring to mind how God was with us. And instead of our spirits being drained because we sacrifice all our emotions to these horrible things that happen, our spirits are lifted because something comes in that altar. Usually in the Bible, it was the fire from heaven. Comes on that altar, takes all of that, and something happens in our lives. It's a place of recognition that God is still with us. I don't know where I would be if I didn't have altars in my life that I constructed at times when I met God and God met me. And there are times in darkness and difficulty and frustration and condemnation I have to go back to those altars. But when I arrive there, I find a sacred space and a sacred place where I'm able to say, God is still with me. And so here's what David said, a place where the sacrifice is done. This is what David, how David put it, is a place not of killed animals and bleeding carcasses. He said, but it's the place of a broken spirit and a contrite heart. You see, the greatest place to build an altar is not at the height of success, it's actually in the depths of your failure. It's right at the core of the worst part of you. The, the, the very thing that, that is the point of our own lives that we ourselves are even disappointed with because we see it as a place of, of brokenness. But David says, build an altar in the brokenness and build it with a contrite heart. That means a heart that says, God, I need you. I know you're with me, but if I build an altar to, to you right here, right now, the sacrifice that comes will change my life because it's not going to cost me my sanity and my peace and my hope and my faith. It's going to build those things. The Bible has many instances of the need to tear down altars. Altars that were erected to commemorate the honoring of the false. Now, I could put in the word, there the word gods, but the moment I put in the word gods, your brain will go somewhere else than where I want it to go and where I think the Bible wants it to go. So yes, it does talk about tearing down the altars to false gods, but let's take the word gods off for a minute and say again that the Bible has many instances of the need to tear down altars erected to commemorate the honoring of the false. The, 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 the things that were never going to help us, but were only ever going to destroy us, but somehow we elevated them in our life to God's status. What, how do you define God's status? When it begins to rule you, your thinking, your emotions, your passions... It has taken on God's status. It has become the Lord of your life. And so many times in the Bible, the men are told, go and tear down the altars of your fathers. That's quite a common thing. Because there are altars in our life which, because of what they take us back to, must be torn down. You can't leave it in place. Sometimes, because of the value that we find by the distorted working of human psychology, we like to retain hurts, we like to retain pains, we like to retain difficulties that happened in our lives, so that at times we can bring them out and use them as a tool or a weapon or a justification for our own behavior. Well, if you knew what happened to me, that's the very thing he's talking about. Those altars that you are still worshiping at need to be torn down. And say this is false. It has become a God. And I will tear it down because I'm no longer going to worship at that altar. But I'm going to build a different kind of altar to a different kind of truth. Because the kind of altars I build reveal who I truly am. Show me your altars, and you show me you. How do I know your altars? It's where you worship. It's the things you can't let go. It's the things you focus on. They're your altars, and that's you, because that's where you worship. And so, one more scripture, an illustration. 
<coughs> and we'll pray for some people. Exodus chapter 20, verse 24 through 26. God is speaking to these people again, these Israelites. And he's speaking to them very specifically on the subject of building altars. Because it's so critically important. And here's what he says. Make an altar of earth for me. And sacrifice on it your burnt offerings and fellowship offerings, your sheep and goats and cattle, wherever I cause my name to be honored. So what's the primary purpose of the altar? Honor. When God shows up in our lives honorably, we are supposed to build an altar inside of us and that's where we go. Wherever I cause my name to be honored, I will come to you and I will bless you. Where? At this altar. This altar what? This altar that's built to honor the truth of who God has become in our lives is where he will come and bless you. If you make an altar of stones for me, do not build it with dressed stones for you will defile it if you use a tool on it. And do not go up to my altar on steps lest your nakedness be exposed on it. So let's talk about that. The do nots, do not build your altar on the top of steps. Don't put steps up to your altar. In other words, don't elevate your thing beyond where it should be. Because we all like to elevate our thing beyond where it should be. Whether we were hurt, disappointed, wounded, how we were spoken to, how we were dealt with, whether we were blessed, if our business has done well, if we're in the moment, in the money, or if our feeling good, we like to elevate our altar above. But he said, don't put your altar up on steps. So this thing is not to be an elevation of ourselves. Here's the reason. If you build your altar up steps... What you see of me when I'm down here is different to what you see of me when I'm up here. So the point he's making in the days of skirt garments is when you elevate your situation and make that your altar, even if it's a bad altar, you look in the mirror and see your face. We don't see your face. We see something else. And so how you see yourself and how we see you are two very different things that will always produce conflict. Why did it come? Because I insisted in elevating my situation to a place it should not be. And that goes for all avenues, success or failure, whatever it is, hurt or blessing, we don't do it. So he gives us three instructions. He said, if you're going to build the altar, don't put it on steps. And secondly, don't build it out of cut stones. Don't make it out of bricks. Why not? Well, because a cut stone or a brick has been formed artificially. It is not a natural shape. It's artificial. You won't find these in a clay pit. You'll find clay in a clay pit. But we can construct our lives in such a way that they are artificial. And we can look either the biggest victim in the world or the most spiritual person in the world. And it's artificial because it has been created by different things, aspects that we have taken on board and we have been molded into something that is not truthful. God says, I don't want that as an altar. If you're going to build it of stone, he says, don't use cut stone. Why? Because when you pick up that stone, I, I, I want you to see that it, 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 it's not, its edges are not square. It, it's, it's, got, it's got acute angles. That, that, that piece of stone is not consistent in its shape. There are many things about that stone that you would say, how's that ever going to fit with anything? 
because it's irregular. But God says, if you're going to do stones, I want irregular stones. I want natural stones. I want them with their cracks. I want them with their holes. I want them with their weak points. I want them with their funny angles. If you're going to build it of stone, make it natural. Come as you are. As God says, that's the kind of altar I want you to build. But then he said, but actually my preference, of all preferences for building an altar, is make an altar of earth for me. Say, so why make an altar of earth for you? Surely he's going to be more pleased with a high altar elevated to honor God for me to come in my humility to the presence of God to show God how badly I've been done to and how amazing I am now to be coming before God. You know, surely it would be that, or surely if it's not that, you, you want it to at least look nice and be orderly and shaped wonderfully, even if it's a lie. But then even with the stones, it's, we can shape that. But he said, John, I know my preference. My preference is, my preference is this. It's this. You see, earth is dirt. And God, in his strange way, is saying, I'd rather you build me an altar from the dirt of your life than anything else that you can select or construct. And that the dirt of your life is actually the holy place where nothing else can be elevated because we recognize it's just dirt. And yet, isn't it interesting that out of just dirt, God formed the man and breathed into him the breath of life and he became a living spirit. You see, the things we think we need to elevate in our lives to attain this place of promise and blessing are the very things that God says, don't build it like that. But the things we despise, the things we don't value, the things we are ashamed of, the things that make our hands grubby and have to be swept up off the floor, <laughs> the God of heaven... The Abba, the Father of Jesus, the creator of the universe says, I'd rather have your dirt. I'd rather have that shapeless, formless dirt. That's the reality of you saying, God, I remember you in this moment. Will you remember me? And isn't it fascinating that the life that feeds us and the food that we eat doesn't grow out of this. It doesn't even grow out of this. Although it's got more chance of this than this because you've all seen how rocks have had seeds that get in the cracks and grow. But you see, if you want fruitfulness, if you want favor, if you want blessing that carries on, if you want prosperity, if you want the thing to grow and mature and nurture, guess where it comes from? It comes from the dirt. Life springs from dirt. So the God of heaven says, I want an altar of earth, an altar of dirt. So when I come... I can just come honestly and say, you said you wanted some dirt. <laughs> Plenty going on here. There's lots of that been happening, but here's what I do, God. I present that as an altar to you. The dirt of that disappointment, the dirt of that situation, the dirt of that wound, 
the dirt of that pain, the dirt of that memory, the dirt of that failed dream, the dirt of that broken relationship, the dirt of my inability to deal with my own weaknesses, the dirt is what I bring, but today I bring it to you as an altar. I'm making it a place where you meet me and where I would meet you, where I reflect and recollect the goodness of God that out of dirt the seed grows. Out of dirt man was formed. And the life of God touches both of them. But it all comes from an altar of dirt. We're all building altars in our lives all the time. And we're all sacrificing to those altars all the time. And our sacrifices are defining who really is our God all the time. But I believe God says to us today, okay, can you think of those, those altars to the false? All the false stuff that's happened in our lives, the hiccups, the problems, the issues, the false starts, the false promises, the false expectations, where we've got that altar. Tear down the altar to the false, he says. And it means we have to tear that down today and say, no, no, no. That does not define me because it cannot refine me. I'm tearing down that altar. But then we come simply, all he says is, bring the dirt. Huh. Do you know what's wonderful? You find dirt anywhere. God says, you think it's difficult to build an altar in your life that is a memorial to the presence and the power of me? Everything you need is around you everywhere, all the time. It's just how you perceive it. So I take the dirt of my life and I say, God, today... This is where I am, but my life itself right now, I make it an altar to you, to your goodness, to your faithfulness, to your redeeming love. This altar is not talking about my sin, it's talking about your love. It's not talking about my unrighteousness, it's talking about your righteousness. It's not talking about my failures, it's talking about your success. And in this soil there is seed, and the seed has life in it, and the seed will grow and produce. And I will have a harvest because in this worship I enter the land of promise. Just an altar of earth, and it's even got creatures in it. There's even living things in that right now. They're thinking, why are you disturbing me? This is my home. Well, when we get to the place of saying, why are you disturbing me? This is my home. I haven't got time to condemn, criticize, abuse, be proud. This is my home where God meets with me. And where his promise is fulfilled. I challenge you tonight. Tear down the altars to the false. Build an altar of dirt. And the presence of God will come. He said, I will meet you there. And he will meet you there. Okay, just two minutes. If, if you tonight know there are altars you need to tear down that are saying all those false things, the false starts, the false image, the false this, the false that. And you're coming saying, I'm not very polished, but, well, in fact, if, if you're up steps, we're not enjoying the view, okay? Come down. If you're saying I'm not polished, I, well, but tonight you say, God, I bring the dirt of my life because you have actually said... That's the altar that you want. So here it is. Here am I. Touch me. If you're saying that tonight, I want you to do something very simple. I think sometimes it's important that we, 
we can action what we're saying. And we're going to do this won't take more than two minutes. I'm going to pray. But if that's you, I want you to stand to your feet right where you are. The altar of the false is coming down. But the altar of the dirt of my life right now I'm bringing and God is going to meet me here. Does anybody want to stand and just pray, pray a blessing on you right now? I'm becoming more and more aware of how we create sacred space and a sacred place within the confines of our life. And it's all this simple stuff. And God says, I'll meet you there. King David says, God, I've sacrificed more lambs and, and sheep and goats and bulls than you can shake a stick at. But he said, I realize they would never get me where I need to be. They were sacrifices that were really focusing on appeasing God rather than receiving from God. So he said, what I bring you now is a broken spirit, a contrite heart. What I bring you now is just the dirt, Lord. I bring you the dirt of my life, a broken spirit, a contrite heart. So that's where the blessing of God is. So I want to pray for you right now. Father, as I hold this, this, this dirt, this, this soil, this earth in my hand, I just release a blessing over everybody who stood in this place tonight because you know the confession of our hearts that we're tearing down the altar to the false and we are now bringing ourselves as an altar to the true. To enter the land of promise that's not without its challenges, not without its enemies, but God is with us every step of the way and every place that our foot treads, you give it to us. We are a blessed people, empowered by Almighty God to bring restoration in this world. And you begin by restoring us. I pray tonight, Lord, for hearts that have been broken, stamped on, spit on, turned into a mud hole and forgotten where the wounds run deep and the pain the pain is, is, is heavy but right now we tear down that altar we refuse to worship there we come into the space of your love and of your kindness and your restoration you lift us up you raise us up you make us sit with you in the heaven places not be trampled down in the hell of our circumstance so, Father, in the simplicity of this prayer, I pray a blessing in this house. I pray a blessing over everyone who is stood. I pray a change in our lives. I pray as we worship at this altar of remembering God has been good to us, that your life will flow, that healing and deliverance and help and provision and healing and restoration will flow, that you prepare a table for us in the presence of our enemies. And our cup overflows because our altar says, surely goodness and mercy will follow me all the days of my life. I release it and we receive it in Jesus' name. Amen. Be blessed. Okay? Be blessed. If it helps you to grab hold of a piece of earth, be my guest. Okay, otherwise, go forth and prosper. And uh, we'll see you to celebrate on Wednesday night when we have our, uh, our razor glass. All right, God bless you, we're done. Thanks for watching. You can find out more about all the Rock is doing locally and internationally at www.rockofyork.co.uk. And why not support The Rock from wherever you are? Just hit the donate button now to help us help others.